Hi guys, this is Rachel on Recovery. We've got a special guest today, Hannah. She's going to talk to us about spiritual abuse and her experience. Um, Hannah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Hannah. Um, I'm 24. I'm a nanny and currently a student. I study animal science and industry, um, which basically is not veterinary medicine, but the aspects of how we care for animals and the husbandry behind it. Um, I'm currently a nanny. And I take care of a four and a five year old. Okay. Um, so you're going to tell us a little bit about why, why yam? Wham? Why? Yes. Um, yeah. So Cultish just did a part one of two series podcast on why wham. There, some would consider a cult, some would not. Um, they're a, Christian organization that wants to spread the gospel and focus more on young people. Um, but the problem with YWAM is there is too large of an overhead and there's not enough authority and autonomy on, there's so many bases all over the world that there's not enough autonomy and, you know, to know who's running what. And so, Every base can kind of do their own thing. Some are good. Some are bad. I had a bad experience. There's a lot of people that had a bad experience with YWAM. And, but there were a lot of people that had a good experience at YWAM. But then, like I said, it depends on the base and where you are and where you go and who the leaders are. Because not everybody has a biblical background. They, the only qualification to t- come on staff for YWAM as you complete their first school, which they call a discipleship training school or a DTS. And that's the only requirement to be on staff and continue and continue to minister to young, uh, young adults. Well, and we can all know that can be very uh, detrimental um, to anybody in ministry. Um, and honestly, uh, I just watched a YouTube video and like done some research on like how to prevent narcissistic pastors. And one of the Mm -hmm. things they said is, you know, have somebody who grew up in the church, like, Mm -hmm. and then wait until they're about at least 30, maybe 50 would be better, you know, and then have them go to seminary and then become a minister. And that would, because they're just, you know, these young pastors, they're given so much authority and it goes to their heads a lot of the time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Not that, I mean, they're just given too much power too early in their career. Yeah. And if they're not given the discipline and the faith to be there, then you have to be mature in your faith to lead. Exactly. Exactly. Because a lot of the times they're like, they like to recruit like young kids out of high school. And a lot of the times after you complete a school, you can become on staff. And so if you're leading they're not much older than you are, maybe like a couple of years older. If you're lucky, five years older, but that's not necessarily the case. Not always. Okay. Well, tell us about some different types of spiritual abuse you experienced. Um, I experienced verbal abuse um, and mental and a little bit of financial, not a lot of financial, but some, but mostly um, emotional and, um, and mental. Okay. Verbal. Uh, um, let's talk about the uh, emotional abuse you experienced. Um, yeah, I was made to feel that my faith was not correct in their terms. They're more of like kind of a prosperity gospel type group, and I'm not raised that way, and I don't believe that. And there's a, had, they had a lot of other beliefs that were different than mine, but YWAM wants to bring people together with inner faiths and interdenominations and it didn't really happen that way like we were told that we could go to whatever kind of churches we wanted to but it was like if you didn't have a car which I didn't have a car I wasn't bringing a car so I was kind of trapped into like going to a church that I couldn't kind of like like but I needed to go to a church because that was part of the requirements um but I was made to believe that you know my beliefs were wrong and that uh I needed to trust God more and everything that I have raised or raised in the church that I was raised in and believed my entire life 
was told it was completely wrong. So it was like, not just through an identity crisis, but like a, well, what happened in my faith kind of crisis? Because it's like, I haven't heard anything else. And to come to this and be like, your faith is wrong is like totally not what I wanted to experience or should have experienced. Okay. Um, can you elaborate like a little bit about, uh, what were the, what were the differences? Um, I was raised in the United Church of Christ and Presbyterian, like kind of back and forth for a little bit. And every week, you know, you either follow the church or calendar, you have sound, like, teachings and structures. And they relied a lot on why I am, or the space that I was at, really believed in, like, oh, God will take care of it. And, like, yes, that's an element, but, like, also we should be laying everything at the feet of Jesus and be like, okay, like, you know, Jesus is awesome, but they focused a lot on, like, oh, God will take care of it, God will provide, and he does. But there was more focus on God less than Jesus, and I never really experienced that before. Mm-hmm. And they were using a lot of um, Old Testament scriptures as opposed to New Testament scriptures. Okay. And, like, there's use in both, which are, are great, but not necessarily, if they did get in the Gospels, it'd be, like, something very specific that they were trying to, like, emphasize um and yeah um could you elaborate a little bit more on that like anything specific that you felt was just not they really liked a lot of Paul's teachings which is fine like Paul's a great dude but like they kind of like yeah Jesus died for us and like brushed over that and went like straight into like Philippians and things that he wrote and was like you have to go out and spread the gospel and spread the word and do everything that like Paul did and the disciples did but you're like you know there's a big chunk of the New Testament that talks about other of Jesus' teaching it's yes he mentioned to go make disciples of all nations of people but you know he also talked about like briefly mentioned like stuff in the Old Testament but it's like you know love your neighbor as yourself and like love people and um you know, stuff in Matthew and solid, you know, building our faith on a solid foundation and things like that. But they just kind of brushed over that and went straight into we need to, like, make as many disciples as we can type thing. So it was more about quantity versus quality. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. And that's that's a huge issue, I think, in a lot of mega churches and a lot of... Uh, Churches that just, they want to get them to be like, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. but they don't want to develop them into disciples. Mm -hmm. And they also like to take a lot of young Christians. Like if you didn't grow up in the church and you just found Jesus, they're like, they like grab onto those people and they're like, this is great. And like, they use them. So like, this is what the gospel is. And they'd like believe it and like take it as their word when they haven't had anybody of like, other like sound faith and they've been in the faith a long time helping them grow like and then they're having those people teach other people when they really have only been a christian like a couple of years but there's nothing wrong with that i think people out like coming to the faith have a different perspective but when you're trying to like teach other people and you're teaching on the streets or you're teaching in another country that can be a little bit problematic oh most definitely i mean you know, there are people who, you know, we're glad they're in faith and we want them mm-hmm. to grow, but they have no business being in leadership until they have worked through a lot of things in faith because becoming a Christian and working through that relationship is something like a marriage, mm-hmm. you know, and you don't ask newlyweds to give marriage advice because really they don't right. know that much. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, And, you know, the fact that they were going after those people is a very kind of predatory against baby Christians. It's like scooping up newborns from the nursery and being like, oh, we're going to convert you and Mm -hmm. we're not going to give you any say in the matter. Yeah. So, no. um, Let's talk about the uh, verbal abuse. Yeah, so I was there for six weeks and then I kind of started to question 
what was going on. And I wrote a newsletter. I had lots of friends in college still and lots of friends who are Christians and lots of friends who aren't. So I kind of made it like a neutral newsletter, kind of mentioned God briefly. But like a lot of my friends don't want to shove it in your face, Jesus kind of thing. And like they're Christians and I don't know a lot of Christians that like shove it, Jesus, shove it in your face kind of thing. So I was like, I don't like it. But my small group leader was that kind of person and she disagreed with my newsletter but I finally like put it out and received excuse me and received nothing but like praises from friends and families and other Christians are like this is great and so that was kind of like a run and they're like you're just too prideful you need to like lay that down I'm like yeah I can't be stubborn headed like I was thinking like okay yeah maybe I can like you know lay this down a little bit but I'd only known them for like a week and a half so I was like mm, I kind of know who I'm talking to and so they let it go. And then a couple of weeks later, we started a fundraising process for where we were going to go on a mission trip. And they didn't like how many um, unnumbered uh, or, like, people that I didn't give a specific amount of money for. Um, but And they also, another thing that was really weird, they had us, like, pray over that specific individual, like, that family or that person, and ask them for, like, a specific amount of money and God will tell us how much money they're going to supposed to give us, which that doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. Um, the letter would basically be like, hi, you know, I'm da da da. I'm raising money for this. Would you give me a donation of $50? There wasn't, it wasn't even written like you get from like something like from like St. Jude or something like that. That has like different bracket amounts of what you want to give monthly and other like, there were no options of that. It was like, hi, I need $100 from you. And I think, you know, in your financial state, I think you can give me $100 for this mission trip. And I was like, that's really weird. Um, so I didn't do that. Like I said, a lot of my friends are in college. They didn't have a whole lot of money. So it's not like they're going to be like, hey, can you give me $20 when that could give you a half a tank of gas or buy dinner? I'm not going to do that to you. Um, and so I didn't. And they were mad. My small group leader was mad because I didn't change those numbers. I had to do a specific total, which is like $4,200, let's say. I don't remember the exact amount, but that sounds about right. And they wanted that certain amount, and everybody had to have that certain amount totaled up and have, they wanted under 10 ask letters, like for an unspecified amount. And I was like, I'm not getting that number. <laughs> There's no way. And they, told me that my parents were coming in for a weekend and so they just kind of like let it go and let it lie and they told me that I needed to pray and have God show me those individuals and ask them for a specific amount of money and then they also told me that I was being prideful and that um, I needed to like lay that down and I was being too stubborn and so then I let it go for the weekend and then come that Monday uh, that whole week I was confronted four times in six days by two different individuals at the same time and then had a ton of one-on-ones. Like almost daily, I had a one-on-one -on -one with my uh, small group leader. And they were basically, they told me that my faith foundation was wrong, that I've been taught wrong things, that me being prideful was blamed on the fall of man and Adam and Eve and the first original sin. Um, they told me that I was being rebellious for not listening to them. And I'm 19 at this point. I'd spent a year in college. I was taking time off. So I kind of know, like, you know, when to question things. And I really was questioning them. And they were getting, putting more pressure on. So then, like, the first day I was like, you know what? No. I, like, received it. And I was like, okay, fine. Whatever you say. So then I left. And I was really starting to, like, question, like, where, who are they or why do they have the right to say that? at any given time. And I was looking at my Bible and I was like, you know, everything that I've ever been taught, like, yeah, that was the first and original sin. Like, yeah, the fall of man, Adam and Eve, but there's Jesus. And like, Jesus like helps us with those things, like pride and things like that. And so I was like, you know, you can work on that as a person. I was like, I could be a little prideful. And like, all right. But they really like to work on pride. Like there's a whole lesson a week, spent like a week on like the roots and shoots of pride, like in the first couple of weeks, really like saying that all of our actions of what we do can be rooted in pride and how to recognize that. And like, I do think they're prideful people, but here's a group of young, vulnerable people from 
18 to 25, let's say, they're young and impressionable, and you're telling them what pride looks like in their lives, then they, it's just a general thing, like, this is what pride is. Then they just wouldn't let go, and I eventually started talking to some family and friends, and they're like, you gotta leave, like, this is, like, we know you, and, like, they've only known you for six weeks, like, you've known you your entire life. This isn't seemed to be, like, a true thing. I don't know where they got it from. And then I, I stood up to them, and like, all three times. And I was like, that's not what I believe. That's not how what I was taught. And they were really mad. And so when I told them that I was leaving, obviously they got really mad because I didn't submit to their power. And I was like, I need my passport back because we were getting ready to go on, like, getting things ready for our trip and applying for visas and stuff like that. Um... I was like, I need my passport back. You know, I'm, you know, leaving and telling, and I told them people that, people that I was leaving, but I didn't tell them why. I just said, you know, I'm leaving because two weeks, maybe a week and a half prior, some other girls had left for similar reasons to mine. Um, and they had left abruptly and I kind of left abruptly too, but nobody helped me. Like the leader dropped me off at the house that I was staying at and it's like, you know, pack up. Nobody brought me dinner. It was kind of like, you're on your own. And I was like, well, you're a Christian group and you're not being very Christ-like right now of, like, people leaving. And only, like, one person ever helped me, like, pack up. And that was, like, briefly. Um, she was a nice girl. I think she felt bad. But she didn't know why I was leaving. Yeah, no. I mean, and that takes a lot of discernment to realize, hey, this is spiritual abuse. It's kind of like being in an abusive rela uh, relationship and being like, mm -hmm. uh, this person's abusive. I can't be with them because yeah. they're abusing me. Yeah. And um, that person has since left the base. I don't know why, but there's been people that are leaving and realizing that spiritual abuse has occurred on this base. And, um, and different hor more horrible stories in mind that are not mine to tell but just the base leadership um didn't see it or they wanted everybody to conform to what they believe in and if you have someone that's been in the faith long enough to know like i don't agree with that and start questioning things they're gonna get mad and they got pretty mad yeah no i mean you know i think a lot of times within a you know, within the Christian faith, I mean, yes, there's going to be things that we don't agree on. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's and what I things... thought the point was like interfaith. Not everybody's going to agree because everybody has a little bit different doctrine, but that was not the case. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit difference between different doctrine and, you know, my way or the highway. And mm -hmm. unfortunately we have a lot of that polarization in our churches and yeah. in our our political system right now. So exactly. Um, no. Um, so that's, that's something to be concerned about overall. Yeah. Um, and realize, I mean, Christianity is one of the most, there is the most diverse religion in the world. Yeah, it is. It is. Thanks guys for listening. Hannah's going to be back next week with us and she's going to tell the second part of her YM story and help us with understanding more about her time at YAM. Thanks for listening. Always follow us on social media. Find us on our favorite podcast. If you're interested in being on the show, contact us on social media or on my website on rachelonrecovery.com. And if you're looking to support us, you can always find us on Patreon. Um, we are, uh, we do have t-shirts, cups, mugs, all kinds of stuff and different tiers of support levels. Um, thanks for listening. See you next Thursday at 10 a.m. Thanks.